I'm Katie Nicholl, one of the world's leading royal correspondents and royal editor at Vanity Fair. Over the past 20 years, I've covered some amazing royal stories, but nothing compares to that of King Juan Carlos of Spain. He was the exiled prince who became a national Spanish hero. He's everything you could possibly want rolled into one man. He was essentially the nation's savior. In this remarkable story, we'll hear from the experts who followed this incredible journey from revered king. He's the bright new hope and everyone's surprised by him. To reviled exile. The king pretty much goes from hero to zero. The whole idea of the royals being almost perfect started to vanish. He became embroiled in scandals which threatened to topple the entire Spanish monarchy. This wasn't just an unnamed businessman collecting millions of dollars in suitcases. This was the King of Spain. It's just been an unmitigated PR car crash. And in a world exclusive, we'll hear directly from the secret lover who was blamed for his disastrous downfall. I mean, I was literally described as a prostitute, well, as a gold digger, surviving eight years of this level of stress. It's just brutal. This is the story of sex, scandal, intrigue, and money. The real life Game of Thrones of the most intriguing monarch in modern history. In August 2020, King Juan Carlos of Spain made a dramatic announcement, declaring in a letter to his son he was fleeing Spain amid a corruption scandal and a missing 65 million euros. The news shocked the entire world and damaged the already fragile reputation of the Spanish monarchy. But Juan Carlos's sudden departure wasn't the first time he'd been exiled. In fact, Juan Carlos was born in exile in Italy in 1938, while a bloody civil war was being fought in Spain between the communists and the ultra-right nationalists, led by General Franco. You've got the rise of the fascistos in Italy, and you've got the Nazis in, in Germany. It's the era of the bully boy, and uh, Spain was not exempt from that. The civil war turned into a bloody conflict on both sides. Nobody could see a way out. There was forced labor, political arrest, and huge numbers of casualties. It was a bloody war. It was a war of brothers against brothers, of neighbors against neighbors, of half of the country against the other half. This was an extraordinarily violent time. The war had ripped Spain apart and cost up to a million lives. In the midst of all this chaos, Juan Carlos is born slap bang in the middle of the Spanish Civil War. Nobody knew what direction the country would be taking and nobody knew the future for the Spanish royal family. They were being forced to watch their country disintegrate from afar, absolutely powerless to what was happening. Juan Carlos's early life was dominated by his grandfather, the former king, and his power-hungry father, Don Juan, who cared for nothing but getting back on the Spanish throne. He had an extraordinarily deprived childhood on so many fronts. If a child from the get-go in life needs unconditional love, that was one of the things that was really missing. There was a lot of tension, there was a lot of suspicion, and all of this, I think, had a great impact on Juan Carlos as a young boy. The other major influence on Juan Carlos's life was General Franco, who ruled Spain with an iron fist. Franco's rule is fear, oppression, brutality, imprisonment. Any word against him could get you imprisoned. It was a time of terror for the ordinary Spaniard. He's a proper, pugnacious, thug, right, with all the trappings and the glory that come with being all-powerful in a country as big as Spain. Franco was an extreme conservative and was desperate to reinstate an all-powerful monarchy in Spain. 
so he needed to find a puppet king he could control. Franco certainly regarded Juan Carlos's father and grandfather as far too liberal, far too soft, and he didn't think that they were the right men to be leading the monarchy at that time. Instead, Franco turned his attention to the 10-year-old Juan Carlos. Franco regarded the young Juan Carlos as a future king, his potential successor to carry on his ultra-right policies. So let's get in this good-looking little fellow with the Bourbon blood cursing through his veins, and let's mould him in our vision of what a real royal leader should be. The older family members who believed it was their divine right to rule had a huge problem with the way Franco was treating Juan Carlos. The whole family, which is already dysfunctional, already characterised by suspicion and tension, really, I think, exploded. They believed that they would be sidelined and that the young man would become the future king. Despite their infighting, the Bourbon royal dynasty were so desperate to regain the throne that they struck a deal with Franco sending little Juan Carlos to Spain to be groomed by the dictator. He's sent in a long journey by himself on a train, and he arrives to this hostile country that has just come out of a civil war, a country that is devastated. He doesn't have any friends. He doesn't have any family. He doesn't even have a school. He had the whole responsibility of preserving the monarchy over his shoulders but you're just a child. You're 10 years old. But imagine the pressure. You're the son, but such is your father's desire to get back onto the throne of Spain, he's gonna trade you in as a playing card, if you like, to see if that's gonna work to manoeuvre himself back onto the Spanish throne. It's, it's quite dark. But there was more darkness on the horizon. In 1956, Juan Carlos made a rare visit to his family home on the Portuguese Riviera, where a traumatic event took place that would shape his life forever. One day, he's playing with his brother in a separate room away from the family, and they're messing about with a 22 caliber revolver. Suddenly, a shot goes off. The family rush in, and Alfonso is lying on the floor, dead. As the boys were alone, nobody knew whether it was an accident or whether Juan Carlos had in fact murdered his brother. Juan Carlos's father grabs him by the throat and says, promise me, tell me you did not do this on purpose. Tell me that you'll ever recover from that. Tell me that that doesn't leave a mark. Tell me that as a parent, that doesn't impact the way you feel about your surviving son, who already is under the wing of the man who's preventing you from sitting on the throne of Spain. So have we got something normal here? No, this is totally abnormal. His father was so angry and upset that he immediately banished Juan Carlos back to military school in Spain. You have gone through a very dark episode. Your brother, your dearest brother has died. You probably know it's your fault. How do you think a child could feel after all that? With his family out of the picture, Juan Carlos was forced to turn to his adoptive father figure, the brutal dictator Franco. Franco had a strong, ultra-conservative and militarised vision for the future for Spain. He wins the war in very uncompromising terms. He was crushing his political enemies, forcing them into labour camps. No one is going to forget the theatrical deaths that took down over 200,000 people. No one was safe in Franco's world, including Juan Carlos. He knew that to survive, he'd have to walk the tightest of tightropes. He has been asked all his life to play a two-hand game. The House of Bourbon versus the regime of General Franco. And he does this very effectively. In public, he played the doting heir, standing beside Franco during official ceremonies and praising his vision for Spain. Franco does not want a big thinker. He wants someone who looks good on camera, a man who can wear a uniform and look people in the eye as the future king of Spain. Even his relationships were decided for him, and Franco insisted that he marry a suitable princess from another royal European dynasty. Following Franco's orders, in 1962, 
Juan Carlos married Princess Sofia of Greece in a lavish ceremony watched by millions around the world. In public, at least, Juan Carlos seemed to be towing the party line. He would just look, listen, and keep quiet. He was starting to calculate what his next moves could be. Behind Franco's back, he began meeting secretly with Franco's enemies, plotting with them to bring democracy to Spain. Many people just thought he was a brainwashed stooge of Franco, and yet here he was double dealing in secret. Juan Carlos is really playing this quite brilliant and very dangerous game. If Franco had found out about it, he would have been in really severe trouble. He was playing with fire here, but he wasn't afraid of what he was doing. Lucky for Juan Carlos, he got away with it. And in 1969, Franco designated Juan Carlos, Prince of Spain, his official heir. Franco regarded the young Juan Carlos as someone that he had personally moulded in to shape his vision of a future Spain. He believed he was strong enough to take the reins. Franco was getting older and his health was rapidly deteriorating. In October 1975, Franco unexpectedly gave full control to Juan Carlos. Just three weeks later, Franco was dead. On the 22nd of November, 1975, two days after Franco's death, Juan Carlos, the supposed puppet, was crowned King of Spain. But the question on everyone's lips was who was the real Juan Carlos? He probably doesn't even know. Does he even really care? It's about survival. And I think the, the hallmarks of his childhood, duplicity, a lack of trust, um, living off his wits, hiding his emotions. That was a winning hand for Spain. King Juan Carlos's new reign signalled a bright new dawn for Spain. And much to the surprise of the Spanish people, he quickly introduced new democratic reforms flying in the face of Franco's regime. He's the new kid on the block. He's the bright new hope, and everyone's surprised by him. As soon as he ascends the throne, Juan Carlos starts dismantling Franco's regime and setting a path from dictatorship to democracy. I'm your knight in shining armor. My name is Juan Carlo, and everything's going to be OK. And look, I'm even giving up power. But not everyone was happy with his new reforms. And in 1981, the new king faced the first real threat to his throne an ultra-right military coup which aimed to turn back the clock to Franco's reign of terror. In a dramatic scene in Parliament, the army generals stormed in and held lawmakers hostage at gunpoint. In they come into the Cortes with their guns in the air, firing pot shots overhead. Within 24 hours, King Juan Carlos became the people's champion, denouncing the coup live on TV. Now, fronting that down, rising above that, that takes guts. He was willing to face down the generals and even put his life on the line for the sake of his country. Really, that killed the Franco threat, stone dead, and the future was now one of constitutional monarchy. The young king had secured the country's democracy once and for all. The failed military coup of 1981 was the definitive moment when people started to like Juan Carlos. It was his most brilliant moment. From this point on, Juan Carlos really could do no wrong. Suddenly, he became the poster boy for monarchy. He's everything from a Spaniard's point of view you could possibly want rolled into one man. People loved him. I mean, he was applauded, he was uh, cheered and he was celebrated. He's helped put modern Spain on the map in front of the whiz-bang pop of the paparazzi. He is numero uno, number one, and he's taken his country with him. For the next three decades, the Bourbon royal family reignited what it meant to be both Spanish and royal, crossing the bridge between celebrity and monarchy. 
They were already adored in Spain and now they were becoming huge stars on the international stage. Everyone wants a slice of Spain, this new, modern, Costa del Rock, you know, place where the sun always shines and there's this good looking blue eyed king with a beautiful wife, Sophia, and a little clutch of kiddies. What more could you want? Juan Carlos and Sofia had three beautiful children, and together they embodied everything a happy, rich, and successful family was meant to symbolize. Their son, Prince Felipe, went on to become an Olympian and married the glamorous former news anchor, Leticia Ortiz Rocasolano. Their eldest daughter, Infante Elena, lived a relatively quiet life outside of the public eye and their youngest daughter, Infanta Cristina, also became a professional sailor and married Spanish Olympian Iñaki Organdarin. But behind closed doors, this picture-perfect family image was beginning to crack. In 2012, the king's daughter, Infanta Cristina, and her sportsman husband, Iñaki Organdarin, were at the center of a scandalous tax and money laundering scam. The royal couple were charged with embezzling six million euros of public funds and lining their own pockets. The Anaki affair caused huge controversy because Spain was in the grips of an economic crisis and here was a member of the monarchy embezzling millions and millions of pounds worth of public funds. That incident, their embezzlement scandal, was a cherry on a very rotten cake arriving, being served on the table of a collapsing Spanish economy. You have something like, among the young in Spain, 50% unemployment. They couldn't believe that a member of the monarchy would do something like this, taking public funds that belong to the people. The whole idea of the royals being almost perfect started to vanish. The anger was unprecedented, and this emotional eruption these young people on the street, one minute they're on the street because they don't have a job, and the next minute on, they're on the street because they want the jugular of some dubious duke who's embezzling their money. How dare he? Suddenly, you know, it's just not quite so cool being attached to the unelected House of Bourbon. In a landmark case, Christina became the first direct descendant of a Spanish monarch to be charged and stand trial in a criminal court. Even though Christina was acquitted of all charges, her star had fallen considerably. She was stripped of her royal titles, stripped of her personal allowance, which went down to zero, and her husband was forced to spend six years in jail for his crimes. It was devastating. That was the beginning of the end. That was when uh, people started to realize that, that not everything was going well with the Spanish monarchy. The Anaki affair is incredibly damaging. It can't be underestimated how damaging it is. And they don't just blame the princess, they blame the king because he is seen as partly responsible for letting it happen. But also people say, if she's doing this, what's he doing? What are they all doing? Are they all taking money? While the Iñaki affair was taking hold of Spain, King Juan Carlos was embroiled in his own scandal. For over 40 years, there had been multiple rumors of extramarital affairs, and Juan Carlos's relationship with Queen Sofia was reportedly on the rocks. Can you really blame Juan Carlos? He's the messiah. He can do no wrong. So guess what? He does what the hell he likes. His most recent prominent affair was with divorced Danish-born businesswoman Corinna Zuzane Wittgenstein, who he met in 2004. And in a world exclusive, we've secured the first televised interview with Corina. I think he saw in me a different kind of woman than he had gotten used to in the past. It will come as no surprise to you that I describe him as extremely charming. I think many, many women found him irresistibly charming. I think it fascinated him that I treated him just like a normal man, as opposed to treating him like this symbol. As Corinna and Juan Carlos's relationship intensified, palace insiders became concerned. The depth of the king's sentiments for me provoked alarm bells ringing in the palace. Um, I think this became problematic in Queen Sophia's eyes. Corinna became convinced that Queen Sophia was plotting against them both and trying to remove Juan Carlos from his throne. Because they were in such a dysfunctional marriage and she was deeply unhappy. The king told me that 
her only objective in life was really to see her son take the throne. Then in 2012, Corinna and Juan Carlos traveled to Botswana on a secret safari trip. While in Africa, Juan Carlos fractured his hip and was immediately flown back to Spain for emergency medical treatment, where the story exploded. What the king thought would be just a little holiday, a fun little jaunt that no one would ever find out about, became one of the defining moments of the decline of his popularity. With Juan Carlos's reputation in tatters, he abandoned Corinna to the intense scrutiny of a hostile media. As her profile heightened, she became public enemy number one. She's a hustler. She's someone who's taken advantage of, of the whole situation. I basically became a media sensation overnight. So I was the um, Lady Macbeth, the sort of Wallace Simpson, having let this man astray. None of it was true. Corinna believed that the media abuse against her was part of a pre-planned smear campaign by the royal family. I was just used as a scapegoat whilst the royal household were rolling out an internal coup d'etat. Whether or not this was a conspiracy, Juan Carlos was certainly damaging the royal family's reputation. And in 2014, he abruptly abdicated in favor of his son, Felipe. I think it became very clear to Juan Carlos that either he abdicated or maybe the whole royal family would have to go. I don't think Juan Carlos had many options. I think the abdication was a right move and uh, at the right time. After Juan Carlos's abdication, his son Felipe and his wife Leticia became king and queen, and with the help of Queen Sofia, they quickly attempted to clean up the image of the tarnished royal family. Anything that was problematic for the royal family, anything that caused them a reputational problem, was simply passed on to me. Corinna believes that the Spanish secret services had been instructed to keep her from talking to the media about the royal family, and more importantly, her relationship with the king. It's been a daily fight um, of intrusion, of surveillance, of harassment, of abusive behavior, and it takes its toll. She claimed she was visited and threatened by the head of the Spanish security services in a bid to keep her silent. He said if, if I did not follow his instructions, then he could not guarantee my physical safety or the physical safety of my children. You know, you go into the survival mode, it's fight or flight. You suddenly realize you're in a dangerous situation. The security services have previously denied Corinna's allegations, and the palace has not commented on them. Even though Corinna and Juan Carlos were now separated, things were about to get even more complicated for both of them. For a long time, there'd been speculation about how Juan Carlos had been making money, but the allegations which emerged were far worse than anyone had imagined. In 2018, all hell broke loose when secret recordings made by a rogue police officer were published in the Spanish media. The recordings suggested that Juan Carlos had countless dodgy dealings with members of the Saudi royal family. In one of the recordings, a female voice, alleged to be Corinna's, refers to Juan Carlos's financial affairs. The voice on the tape states that Juan Carlos goes to the Middle East and returns with suitcases stuffed full of cash. This wasn't just an unnamed businessman collecting millions of dollars in suitcases. This was the king of Spain. People could imagine that Juan Carlos liked to live his life, but they couldn't imagine that the whole thing was so rotten. The revelations from the tapes sparked mass protest and became the catalyst for investigations into Juan Carlos's financial dealings. The former king is under investigation. This couldn't be more shocking to the Spanish people. I mean, it's the greatest fall from grace you can imagine. It's just been an unmitigated PR car crash. Central to the investigation is a huge but mysterious $100 million payment from the late king of Saudi Arabia transferred into a Swiss bank account linked to Juan Carlos. Nobody could explain why Juan Carlos was receiving $100 million in cash from the Saudi Arabian king. What are these backhanders, you know, these bungs of money that are crossing borders? Why are they not being taxed? 
Why haven't they been accounted for? Does Juan Carlo really need that much money? The scandal suddenly escalated when it was revealed that Juan Carlos had transferred the balance of the money into an account linked to Corinna. Suddenly, Corinna is implicated in this huge scandal when it's revealed she received 65 million euros from Juan Carlos. Nobody could explain why. He was very adamant that he wanted to make sure he would always take care of me. He was also very worried that his family would not respect his wishes had he put them in a will and he was just convinced if he died, this will would be ripped apart. She doesn't look like she's short of a penny or two, does she, Karina? Do you know what I mean? It's not like the prince saved the pauper in this relationship. When the gift finally arrived, I was obviously surprised because it was a very generous sum. However, in the context of a net worth that has been estimated by Forbes to be around 1.8 billion, it, it is not an unreasonable amount of money. Corinna is now not only facing her own legal case to justify why she accepted 65 million euros from the Crown, she is also preparing a lawsuit against Juan Carlos and other unnamed defendants at the High Court in London. People think I'm some sort of a criminal. I've done nothing wrong, and I'm very confident that the Swiss proceedings will close and that they will end positively for me. Until court proceedings conclude, there will be a question mark over Juan Carlos's finances and where and how he was acquiring such large sums of money. With the latest raft of allegations, it's a very real reality that we could see the second Spanish member of the royal family in the dock facing serious charges. The royal family has not commented on the allegations of financial wrongdoing. Regardless of the outcome of the investigations, the whole affair has wreaked havoc for the Spanish royal family, with its very future hanging in the balance. King Felipe was not only embarrassed about his father, but he was absolutely furious that he was going to have to clean up his mess. King Felipe did the only thing he could, which was to cut his father off without a cent. It's about survival for these big houses. And if there's somebody who's going to drag you all down, then what do you do? You cut the limb off, you get rid of it. And once you've been discarded or cut out, that's it. This was Felipe's last ditch attempt to save his reign and the future of the Spanish monarchy. But the drama surrounding Juan Carlos was still dominating the news cycle. At the same time, Spain was being ravaged by the coronavirus, which had caused a shockingly high death toll and a nationwide lockdown. In the midst of the pandemic, the former king made a dramatic announcement. Suddenly, out of the blue, Juan Carlos writes a letter to Felipe announcing his decision to leave the country immediately. A moment of crisis is really when your neutral figurehead, your monarch, should come into his own, you know, rising above COVID, talking to the people, boosting morale. And instead, what's he doing? He's sneaking out the back door. For a period of two weeks, it seemed like the king had vanished into thin air. No one had any idea where Juan Carlos had fled. Juan Carlos was nowhere to be seen. Nobody knew where he was. It was a catch me if you can situation. It was completely ludicrous. Eventually, the former king surfaced in Abu Dhabi, ending weeks of speculation. The whole thing was catastrophic for his image, for his popularity, and for the future of the monarchy. With Juan Carlos out of the picture, the show must go on for the Spanish royal family. King Felipe is now faced with the difficult task of proving to the Spanish people that there is still a place for the monarchy. For Felipe, he has two major battles on his hands. He needs to rehabilitate the monarchy in the minds and the hearts of the Spanish people, while also unifying the country and get them to fall in love with the monarchy that they once adored. I think there is still a place for the Spanish monarchy. I do think that Felipe VI is doing a fantastic work. And if he does things right, he may achieve the survival of the monarchy. But there is a glimmer of hope for the new king. His heir and daughter, Princess Leonor, symbolizes the change that the Spanish monarchy needs. 
The young princess represents everything that the old guard do not. I think Prince Leonor symbolizes a new generation, just like Juan Carlos was the image of a new and modern Spain during the 70s. We need to preserve the institutions that have worked. And the monarchy is the basic pillar of those institutions. For nearly 40 years, King Juan Carlos I was that pillar. But now, the pillar has crumbled. He is, in many ways, the architect of his own problems. In part, he's responsible for where he finds himself now. However, for someone who brought the monarchy back from exile and who created a democracy post the Franco regime, it must be the ultimate defeat to now find himself in exile.